Hello and a very warm welcome to the final session of the Crossings Film Festival series. Our second uh, documentary panel uh, is called Documentary as Pedagogy, Teaching Documentary, Teaching with Documentary. We have a very distinguished panel of speakers, uh, filmmakers and educators to discuss the subject. And I'll get straight to it by introducing the panel. Um, so the panel will be moderated by um, Anjali Montero. And uh, I'd just like to say first, Anjali Montero and Kipi Jayasankar, uh, who's also on the panel, are documentary filmmakers, educators and researchers who are professors, who were professors at the School of Media and Cultural Studies at uh, Tata Institute of Social Sciences till 2020, till very recently. Um, also on the panel, Nelita Vachani uh, is a filmmaker, writer, and educator. She teaches documentary history, theory, and criticism at the Tisch School of the Arts, New York University, and at the Asian College of Journalism in Chennai. Uh, also, um, a very warm welcome to Samira Jain, who is an editor, filmmaker, and teacher. She has been course director of the Creative Documentary Course at SACAC, New Delhi, since 2013. Um, also, a very warm welcome to Shoni Ghosh, uh, the Sajad Zahir Professor of Media at the AJK Math Communication Research Center, Jamia Milia Islamia. She is an essayist from popular culture and a documentary filmmaker. And finally, a big warm welcome to Sunavi Sharma, who is an independent filmmaker and teaches at the Film and New Media Program at NYU Abu Dhabi. A very warm welcome to all of you. Thank you all for participating in this uh, final session. And I'm just going to hand it over to Anjali Montero. Once again, the panel is documentary and pedagogy, teaching documentary, teaching with documentary. Over to you, Anjali. Uh, thank you, Lalit. It's, it's a real pleasure to uh, moderate this discussion today and to have uh, such an eminent group of uh, teachers, filmmakers uh, who have many years of experience. And I really look forward to uh, you know, our interaction. Uh, so I guess we would be starting first with a more uh, general discussion on documentary, the changing space of documentary in the Indian context and uh, moving on to how it, uh, you know, reflects on our uh, pedagogy. Uh, so to start off with, uh, uh, I think it would be interesting to explore, uh, you know, what over the last uh, five years have been the main trends in uh, documentary uh, in terms of the changes in form, changes in narrative uh, choices, topics, uh, and so on. Uh, so, uh, Surabhi, would you like to start with addressing that? Uh, firstly, thanks for having me here, Lalit, and thank you uh, uh, to all of you. Um, I think uh, I'm going to I'm going to take a shot at trying to sort of locate where documentary is in India today. Um, but I think one of the key uh, the key ideas within uh, within independent documentary filmmaking since the last two decades, perhaps since digital technology sort of made uh, it so much easier for people to make films. Um, I think two, three interesting trends can be seen. One is a lot of filmmakers really looking at their own location, making films from their own location, looking at themselves and their lives sometimes, but uh, also trying to sort of define um, where they are while making the film. And that has led to a whole uh, slew of, I think, um, formal choices, uh, a set of formal choices that have taken them away from the kind of cinema that actually inspired, let's say, someone like me in the 90s, uh, the kind of documentary filmmaking that uh, one was exposed to as students in the 90s was one of uh, testimonials, one of exposés at a time when there was no visual media other than the state-run television. Uh, I think by the 90s and by the time um, digital technology comes in, there is a, a way to start exploring the political by, by looking at, by, by a lot of self-reflexivity for one, but two, also to start questioning why am I looking? 
I think that is uh, it's it's not it's not come in immediately, but it's it's over the last two decades. I, I can see a lot of younger filmmakers sort of really exploring that idea. And in the past ten years, I think one of the one of the key provocations for people to want to pick up the camera is to work against the the profusion of images around us. So there's a way in which everybody, including uh, all of us who sort of you know, uh, started making films before this this kind of crazy noise, image noise all around us, is for each of us to start stepping away from the image to think about image making. And I think it's been, um, it's as someone who considers herself to be uh, primarily uh, an audience to the to, to cinema, but specifically documentary and specifically India, um, it's, it's, it's just been a fascinating journey to see how there is absolutely no box that we can think of to slot the, the documentary form. It has exploded in every direction, starting from who picks up the camera to what people are doing with the image. You know, um, I, I've had the privilege of actually uh, watching a lot of student work over, not as a teacher, but as an observer, as an audience uh, for the for the last decade. And uh, I, I cannot imagine a more exciting time to really think through the idea of documentary filmmaking in India. So this is a very, very broad outline. I, I pretty much am aware that I've not said anything about anything. But I think the only thing I want to sort of underscore is the 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 multi-headed, uh, incredibly uh, agile creature that we are all, you know, co-creating in a sense in this uh, in this sphere. Uh, thank you, uh, Surubi. I think there were very many interesting things to think about, and I really like the way you uh, kind of uh, connected the larger context with the the kind of uh, filmmaking practice that is emerging and that, as you say, is, is extremely uh, exciting. Uh, Shoini, as somebody who has been, uh, you know, working with students for a very, very long time with documentary, you know, how would you, would you like to respond to some of these uh, uh, observations or do you, you know, is there any, something different you'd like to say in this regard? I'm sorry, I think Shohini is a, could somebody unmute uh, Shohini? Uh, sorry, we can't, you're still muted. Uh, could Shohini be unmuted, please? Oh, sorry. Okay, Shohini seems to have a, a poor connection. So any anybody who would like to respond to this, add to this, Am I am I audible? Yes. Okay. So, am I am I audible? Yeah. Yes. Yes, you've come back. Uh, and there seems to be a problem with uh, uh, Shohini's audio. So, uh, Jayashankar, would you like to maybe yeah. add to this? Or... Thank you for uh, the opportunity to be part of this uh, panel and, and with friends. Uh, Surabhi has kind of set the tone for uh, uh, the discussion. And uh, just to add to a few points, uh, which I think is relevant, one is uh, we, we find greater incorporation of observational elements uh, and uh, with, the, with the shift to the digital, because probably that's possible, you know, with more unobtrusive camera uh, and uh, sound equipment. And it's possible to do that kind of work, which probably, as Surabhi said, when we were working, it was, you know, bulky equipment wouldn't make it possible, wasn't possible. It's not just the equipment, but also the kind of 
approach to uh, filmmaking in that sense has shifted quite a bit. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, the, uh, the films are kind of, I mean, it kind of, we see a, both the kind of films, but the kind of films that cater to international television markets, which are based on uh, human interest stories with, a, with an art, uh, with a dramatic art. And on the other hand, more immersive, as uh, sort of we pointed out, more uh, immersive, abstract essay elements, uh, uh, which are reflexive uh, in the documentary genre as well. Uh, and one of the aspects is that the field has, uh, uh, has now become really diverse through funding possibilities, which continue to remain limited and dismal for uh, most filmmakers. Uh, you know, and also the idea of non-fiction watching, which was probably non-existent many years ago, is kind of uh, interestingly has uh, uh, got some kind of uh, fillet because of the you know platforms like uh, uh, YouTube or other uh, other such uh, uh, form formats, uh, because I think people have at least kind of now. Has an opportunity have an opportunity to watch non-fiction earlier it was either bollywood and or, or documentaries that were shown as part of the uh, fd bouquet so there was i mean and also or the other possibility was uh, uh, narrow casting so i think the idea of non-fiction watching because when we whenever we interviewed students who say that they're interested in documentary film and if you ask them have you seen any so they would say none you know except for some wild life documentaries. But now there are a lot of other kind of non-fiction narratives that people are watching, be it a cookery show to, you know, various other things. Uh, would anybody else like to respond to this question or moving on to, because I think this also, uh, I think uh, Surabhi did uh, sort of uh, talk about uh, how the, the the definition of political itself seems to be changing. And there was a certain kind of political activist film that we probably grew up with that we, when we entered the field as documentary filmmakers, we kind of engaged with. And, uh, you know, today that has, has uh, shifted quite a lot. And, uh, you know, the, the very nature of what we call political and the political kinds of political engagements of Indian documentary. Uh, so maybe we could talk a little about this and also how this uh, reflects in our teaching practice. Uh, I don't know who would like to go with. Samira, would you like to address this? Yeah, sure. I could. Can you hear me? Yes, very clear. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think this whole political, uh, you know, the category of political is so exciting because it's completely expanded. And uh, I mean, in the pause, as teachers, I think we're, there's some sort of echo, right? Somewhere. Uh, anyhow, I'll just carry on. Just stop me if there's a problem. So it becomes very, very interesting to see this because when we look at a certain kind of, you know, the kind of activist filmmaking you referred to, it's, it's of course, directly political, but it's so rhetorical in its nature and its communication that actually it becomes like a, you know, like an argument that kills itself because you're basically speaking the same thing and you're proclaiming a truth with a capital T. And you have your opponent who's also proclaiming the truth with a capital T. And you can go on endlessly arguing forever, you know. And that's, uh, it's, it's sort of like the speaking of the enemy's language kind of thing. Now, what is quite exciting to do actually with students is to actually uh, really sort of deconstruct some of this. And to, to sort of really look at what is it that could be considered political, you know. And in a sense, when we sort of try to excavate that, we find that the personal and the political are not at opposite poles at all, you know. Uh, so it's also what you look at, that the act of choosing something in itself is, is political, you know. And uh, so um, 
I I mean, this would really be nicer if it was a discussion, but I can sort of hold forth on this, if you like, for a bit. Um, it's it's actually quite interesting because you, for instance, if you take, say, even the idea of, um, you know, let's say randomly I'm picking up something that comes to my head, which is to actually look at, let's say, a student who's looking at the uh, the violence that happened in Northeast Delhi um, around the time of the anti-CA movement, uh, which I think we're all a little familiar with. So, I mean, in that sense, it's like this very overtly political choice to choose something like that. But in dealing with it, and through the mentoring and excavating of that whole process, you find that actually you are stating the obvious, you are being rhetorical, you are repeating what everybody knows, and somebody else, and around the CAA, there's been a lot of propaganda from the other side also. You know? So you see then that somebody can just counter you and you can be in this endless war of words. So what do you do? And how are you political in the truest sense of the term? And that's when you get into actually looking at the politics of representation. And once you get into that, a whole lot of things open out. You know, Are you going to interview so-and-so? How is that testimony going to be taken? Is there a violence happening in the way that person is being interviewed? Are there several levels of violence operating here? And so on and so on, you know. So I think this whole idea of the political is actually, I feel, at the heart of, in a sense, any representation. I would say that for fiction as well. But as non-fiction filmmakers, we are, you know, even more on the edge and alert to this, you know. So I would say that, you know, a very quiet film which looks at where a student looks at her grandmother who stays at home and is not a significant person but basically does some reading and some embroidery and cooks well, the way that is represented, that in itself can become extremely political. You know? so, so this is just really to throw out. I mean, there's a lot to say here, but it would be nice if uh, perhaps other people would like to um, speak about this and then maybe I can come back. Uh, yeah, anyone who would like to uh respond to this or uh i think i think that's a that's a very interesting point that you make is and i'm sure that in our teaching too there is much more uh sort of discussion around the politics of representation and the ethics of representation than there used to be in earlier times where you know the i think the the form itself and our uh, relationship with our uh, you know, subjects uh, was was something that tended to be taken for granted, and it was the quote unquote messages or you know getting across a particular agenda that uh, was important. Uh, but uh, I mean, anybody who'd like to come in here, uh, you know, Shoini, yeah. would you like to speak of Nilita? Sure. Yeah. So yeah. Samira, um, can you hear me? Yeah. So Samira, I think you just hit the nail on the head in the in what you said and Surabhi I can you really laid out uh, you know how documentary has changed now th through the democratization of the equipment that's available uh, but to continue from what Sam Samira was saying it's uh, politically it's really about how you show something rather than what you're saying it's no longer so much about what you're saying but how you show something can be very politically politically direct, even though you're not perhaps saying anything at all in words or through uh, rhetoric. And uh, in my teaching, I mean, it's, it's for me, I see a real difference uh, when I teach film students versus when I teach journalism students. Um, so I wanted to talk about this because with my journalism students, it's, it's really in some senses, I have to get them to just stop on their tracks and really think about everything they're doing. Because journalism is such a different medium from documentary filmmaking. I think the entire way of, a journalist's way of 
looking, listening, seeing, producing, crafting comes from a very different place. Uh, because um, with journalism, a documentary is reportage. So already the journalist is supposed to know what exactly they're saying. So when they go into the field and it's to produce something, they already go in with a very clear idea. They have an agenda. They already know the answers. And then it's a question of what is your take on this? You, I hear that a lot. What's your take on this? The other thing is we have to go and get some shots and get some sound bites. And uh, so whatever, the, whatever they produce at the end of the day is something uh, that you could predict even before they went in to do the field work, if, if you can call it field work, right? So to try to teach documentary when you come from that kind of a mentality is just really interesting and challenging because I, I really have to tell the students, you know, okay, you think that you're going into this village and um, there's no school there and the school is three kilometers away so life is just dreadfully hard and horrible. And so you're going to go and ask someone the question, isn't it difficult for you that your child has to walk three kilometers every day? And then you hear this answer, yes, it is just terribly difficult. So then I have to ask the students, well, what did you learn from this? I mean, what is it that you are saying that you didn't know before and actually you didn't really know anything? So try to get that mentality moved out of the brain and to get a student to go out and think that they know nothing, that I'm going here, I really know nothing, and I'm going there to learn, to listen, to just look at the landscape, to just feel something. And then even after that, maybe it'll take me some time to really even know what is the question I'm even asking? And is there a question that I'm asking, right? So for me, uh, it's it's been fascinating because I teach at a journalism school and I teach at a film school, and the whole and and now documentary is becoming um, you know you use it in every you use it in journalism because we we have multimodal um, you know uh, reportage now and where like New York Times etc they have op docs which are pretty very interesting you know short films so there is that scope to explore the world, to explore reality, but in a very nuanced documentary uh, way, which is so much about investment of time, you know, investment of uh, ways of seeing, ways of being, ways of looking, ways of thinking, which are just really not there in the journalistic framework to begin with. So, so you know, I grapple with this a lot. It's really about, you know, even how you approach something out there uh, without already thinking you know everything about it. Uh, yeah, I think that was a really, uh, you know, perceptive and important difference that you bring out. And in fact, probably that also relates to the kinds of shifts that have taken place in documentary because in an earlier uh, era, probably documentary, you know, did have a more journalistic kind of uh, frame within which it operated. And, uh, you know, today that space has been, you know, taken by something else, by, uh, you know, by the news channels 24-7, breaking news and all of that, where, uh, or even print journalism, as you point out, that has gone into, uh, you know, the, the field of visual, the visual. So, uh, you know, documentary ha has had over the past two decades, as Surabhi said, to kind of reinvent itself and uh, to, to, to look at itself more critically and to, and filmmakers have had to, you know, look at their practice and change their practice. And of course, this also reflects in, uh, you know, our teaching. So, uh, Shoini, would you like to respond to that or would like to talk a little about how this uh, you know, these shifts uh, really affect our practice as and our pedagogy as teachers. You know, what I have found, can I be heard now? I think I have probably a little more of a stable connection. Um, you know, what I find very use, uh, what I find uh, quite essential when students come to learn the documentary, and I teach in an institution where, you know, these are students of film and they're students of journalism, uh, is that, uh, 
uh, very often students will have a more nuanced idea about fiction filmmaking, uh, but a very, very received conventional idea about documentary filmmaking. So I think documentary filmmaking, when you are teaching documentary filmmaking, it's also a, a lot about the student unlearning many things. Because there's been a long history of documentary being kind of uh, seen as a mode that has a more privileged access to authenticity, truth, reality. And the students, and that's why they feel that they can take the camera, go there, shoot something, and that will be the reality and that will be the truth. And I think that to start unpacking these concepts right at the start, you know, starting with the whole debate around the indexicality of the camera, where does this idea come from that, you know, documentary is this domain of rationality, neutrality, uh, you know, the scientific temper, whereas the, you know, fiction film is the, the place of imagination. And, you know, I find that to break that, to question the idea of authenticity, reality, uh, making a distinction between realism and reality, I think that that really helps, you know, because people do come with that idea that, okay, this is the domain of imagination and all that, but documentary is about truth. And somehow it will, you, know, uh, uh, you know, allow you to access the truth. So then, you know, I ask questions like, okay, uh, you know, if we had a, a camera in the classroom, uh, what would it show and what would it not show? You know, it would cover all of us and we would see everybody. They say, oh, we may not be able to see this corner. I say, okay, we have 10 cameras. We see everything. And then I say, but what can't we see? And then somebody will say, oh, we can't see our emotions. We can't see what we are feeling. And I said, but then documentary must have a language also to express that. And then, you know, what? How, how do you do that? How will you express emotions? So then it starts taking us in a different uh, you know, path. So I find that useful uh, is to kind of break the common sense assumptions about the documentary and then say that it is actually as interpretative, as subjective as fiction films and that there is no automatic reality or truth that will emerge if you just keep your camera on. There is no notion of the unmediated truth. And then uh, I, I find that approach can often work to kind of dismantle it and then look at, I say, the, okay, so there is, you know, we have a whole, uh, you know, the, the, the largest conference is called Visible Evidence. The, you know, there's a whole series of documentary books called Visible Evidence. How do you capture invisible evidence? What are the filmmakers who have done that? How have people tried to do that? And that um, immediately foregrounds the idea of form. You know, then telling becomes as important as the story, sometimes, you know, more important. Uh, that, I think, very often works in teaching to right at the beginning tackle this question, because otherwise people come with this rather received idea that, oh, you know, why we're going to take the camera out and we are going to shoot the reality. Yeah, yeah. that's that's something that we've also encountered a lot in our uh, teaching, you know, if you start out, you know, with asking students to, you know, talk about what is a documentary and they come out with all these, I mean, the immediate response would be, you know, yeah, it's a documentary and a documentary versus fiction. It's always as if they are uh, kind of polarities that, that can't uh, sit together. So, it's it's so important what you say you know unlearning is as important as uh, learning and also engaging with uh, you know the work of a range of different uh, you know documentary filmmakers and uh, because the kinds of things that people have seen also shape uh, you know the way they they think I guess and you know it's it's more the journalistic kind of stuff that people see or you know the the Oscar winning documentaries that you know, people then begin to see as, you know, the way a documentary should be made. So, uh, yeah, that's that's always, uh, you know, quite a challenge. And if I, if I, I can just add one more thing, just to throw it open to my uh, co-teachers, and that is, and I don't know whether you uh, face this, well, one of course is to say that there is a very good tradition of journalistic documentaries, or even if you were to see something like, you know, the Times of Harvey Milk, uh, a wonderful documentary, never fails to, you know, kind of move students, etc. So I think that 
all kinds of documentaries have their uses, maybe not the Netflix ones very much, but uh, you know that but all these kind of different kinds of traditions are, have been actually have got very rich things to offer. But one of the things that we uh, now uh, progressively find is that the students who are coming to us and our students don't necessarily come with the idea of making a documentary. They could be making a documentary or a fiction film or a hybrid film. But we do uh, realize that a lot of their experiences are with the digital public and mediated through the smartphone. So their uh, you know, experience of being in an uh, actual location is very limited. So we've started this observation exercise where they can't take a phone. They have to choose an area. They have to go there alone. And they can only take notes. And they have to come back and report after spending a whole day there. And that, in some ways, becomes a very important exercise for them, which we, when we started it, we didn't think it would be so you know, interesting. That's because our own experience of how we made documentaries was very different or how we engaged with people. So a lot of our students whose lives are deeply mediated by uh, you know, uh, social media, uh, they have to be also given the skills to engage with the world outside. So whether if they're making fiction films and they have to be able to speak to people to persuade them to act in their films when they can't pay them a hefty fee or go into the location and learn to talk to strangers, all these things were, uh, you know, we somehow with the kind of lives we led or if we did street theater or we did something else or we went to a demonstration, somehow our engagement with the world of, uh, you know, uh, lived experience as Michael Renner calls it, you know, uh, was something that we were used to. But we now very often have a generation that hasn't been exposed to all that. So for them, uh, the pedagogical modes have to be different. And one of the things that I've always said, and it is not new, but I, and that is that whether or not you decide to become a documentary filmmaker in your life, just the learning to make a documentary is a fantastic pedagogical tool. And so many of our former students who are now making these big Bollywood films, and when they come to talk to the students, they talk, they refer back to their experience of being documentary filmmakers, you know, what it taught them, particularly the cinematographers talk about it, because you have to go into a real location, face its unpredictabilities, develop research skills, both in the library and on location. You have to be able to troubleshoot right there. You have to be self-sufficient. Things will be thrown your way. You're, you don't really have a script that you can fall back on. You're constantly thinking till the very end. And that's a very, very demanding process. And once you've gone through that, whether or not you want to become a documentary filmmaker in your life, as just a learning tool, it's uh, very, very good for the students. So I've always felt that documentary as a pedagogical tool is important whether or not the student uh, you know, goes into documentary filmmaking for the rest of their lives. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's really uh, you know very very true. In fact, uh, you know, uh, I don't. Jai Shankar, would you like to talk about how we locate documentary in our program? Yeah, I think I'll just kind of add on to what Shuini said. This is a it's a very interesting pedagogical uh, opportunity for us to kind of talk about many things. You know, shoes and ships and ceiling wax, so to speak, because uh, our course is not a filmmaking course. We are not a film school. So, uh, and that the program that we run is an MA in Media and Culture Studies, which is uh, various other courses as well. So, uh, it has a mix of uh, theory courses, including uh, Media and Culture Studies, as well as inputs in social sciences, research methodology, uh, and also, you know, say radio, you know, all, uh, it's a kind of a course that kind of brings together a whole lot of other skills and uh, perspectives as well. So, but documentary, we find is a site where they actually bring to all, all their learnings together because it also involves research, it involves kind of working with communities, it, result, it involves, you know, questioning this signifying practice itself as to how do you, uh, you know, the ethics and politics of it. And it also has uh, implications for their research as well. And as Shoini pointed out is that, you know, they think of documentary as a, uh, as a you know, a, a value-free, neutral, uh, fly-on-the-wall kind of uh, mediation of reality. But 
as it is not, so is research as an activity that is not value, new, value neutral, but it's also shot through with politics of its own. It's uh, kind of in and through relationships of power. And, you know, so I mean, that way, you know, we are able to connect the dots using documentary as an important site. And uh, uh, in, in our, of course, one of the major uh, theater that it, all this happens is the most interesting city in the world, if I may say so, Mumbai. So, you know, that itself is a great learning experience for them to just go out into the community and work with communities and kind of deal with the kind of diversities and the kind of fault lines that you find in the city uh, is itself an interesting uh, 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 learning opportunity for them. So, uh, in our course, they make at least two or three documentaries shot to, you know, a final uh, media project. So for, for us, it's, a, it's an important site where they actually have all their learnings. Uh, would any of the other uh, panelists like to come in on that or, uh, or we could, uh, because I think uh, we, we are moving from a more general discussion to looking more specifically at uh, you know, pedagogical strategies at, uh, you know, the programs themselves. And of course, you know, different programs are very different from each other. I mean, I mean, I know a little about the kinds of, uh, you know, places where all of you are teaching. So it would be really nice if you could, uh, you know, share a little about uh, your program and also the, the place of documentary in your program and how you, uh, you know, see the, the students as, uh, you know, growing through the whole process of, or, you know, engaging with a documentary as a form. Uh, Surabhi, would you like to come in? Sure. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I'm just now at a, at a liberal arts program, at an undergraduate liberal arts program. Uh, my own training in film happened at a film school, so it took me some time to, to, to get used to the idea of being in an undergraduate space and a liberal arts program. And when I joined, uh, my program was really largely uh, quite centered around fiction filmmaking and fiction also in the, in the conventional story arc kind of a kind of a way. But the, the courses themselves that existed uh, had a kind of openness with which which allowed every faculty member to shape it in a particular way. And I think what has been fascinating for me uh, and, and fascinating for me, primarily for my practice, I still see myself more as a filmmaker. Teaching is just a three, three year old engagement for me uh, as of now. But what has been fascinating for me is uh, to be in this liberal arts space. Um, sort of made me reflect on my own uh, filmmaking practice and start articulating perhaps for the first time in my journey, uh, what do we mean by research-led practice? Because as a documentary filmmaker, uh, my, my work is really centered around research-led practice. And because I was in a space that was very fiction-oriented, Students are actually very open and eager and hungry for all kinds of influences. I was able to really think, and I'm still able to think through the idea with them as to how your research is not just data that you're, or information that you're collecting, but it's also the site where you're forming your relationship with both your subject, but equally with yourself and how, how you sort of develop your, your your research question really has to necessarily impact your formal engagement. You cannot say, I've done my research, now I'll think of the form. The two have to go hand in hand. And it's, a, it's such an organic process when you're working with students, right? Sometimes when they come back having a very frustrating conversation, um, it's, it's, it's very important uh, for them to start seeing that that should determine how they film, how they want to take the conversation forward or not, where they want to place the camera, what lens they want to use, given how uncomfortable the person is, what kind of intimacy or distances 
this kind of research needs to produce. And so to integrate the question of form with your research process, with what you want to say, with your location and a certain amount of reflexivity is just it's just literally like a, a thread running through like this even stitch, you know. Um, and I think this kind of articulation of, of the process uh, becomes evident when you're working with students. When you are immersed in your own practice, sometimes it's, it's impossible to, to, to understand this uh, process. And for me, what has, it has also done in this space is given that I have... I have students who might be double majoring in history or in so you know uh, social research and uh, policy or music or engineering. Actually, I have engineering students whose engagement with with the idea of film is so diverse, and that diversity in the classroom is just bouncing off each other in insanely productive ways. You know, uh, every every cut then becomes necessary to to reflect on. And through that cut, we are talking about not just form and, and, and practice, but we are really talking about how do we, how do we see every, every magnification, every composition, every cut, every sound element that has been added or removed and so on and so forth. And so I've actually st stopped categorizing documentary with fiction. And a student is working on her fiction script uh, I'm forcing her to go interview people to figure out, you know, what kind of characters are have this conflict. Or if a student is saying, I want to make a documentary on XYZ issue in um, Abu Dhabi, I'm forcing them to first imagine, a, 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 just imagine a conversation. Just, just fictionalize a conversation between the person you want to film and that person's, uh, you know, family back home. Fictionalize your understanding so that you go into it with a certain degree of, uh, I don't know, uh, eagerness to listen, perhaps. I don't know. I'm sort of, you know, and it, it sort of is coming full circle for me personally, because I trained in the FTI. So one trained in fiction. And when I came out and I'm one to date, I still hold a lot of regard for testimony. I think testimony is a really important form to take. But when I came out with this kind of fiction training, I could not do testimony in the way I imagined I would do. You know, it had already messed up my, my in a very good way, I think, I hope. But full, I'm coming full circle back to not, not following these categories, using one kind of research practice to interrupt the other. And, you know, for me, it's been really... Uh, yeah, I think I, I, I'm articulating what documentary is for me for the first time in in quite a quite a clear way, if that makes sense. Thank you, uh, Surbi. I think that was uh, really interesting. And uh, but I before we move on to something, it's because it, it, what you're saying sparks off really a lot of ideas. How do we one is the, the the kinds of dichotomies on which uh, you know uh, documentary practice has tended to be based in the past. You know, fiction versus non-fiction, or you know, documentary as art versus documentary as uh, you know, education and activism. But we'll come to that in a bit. But, so I think uh, you know we we are sort of grappling with such a fluid and uh, changing field as teachers, as practitioners, and it's really interesting how. Our engagements with younger filmmakers also, uh, you know, I mean, we learn so much uh, from those engagements and how that begins to reflect back on our practice. I mean, for I think me as a teacher and a, and a filmmaker, that has been one of the most exciting, uh, you know, uh, sort of things about occupying both the, the both positions as a filmmaker and a and a teacher. But uh, Samira, would you like to? Uh, uh, come in on this because your program is a little different from uh, the others. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, you know, when we started this course, it's been almost nine years now. Uh, it was uh, it was a kind of a decision to take because if you just called it a filmmaking course, the default position is fiction. 
you know, you hear of a filmmaking course and it's obviously going to be a fiction course, uh, given the hierarchies uh, of perception around this. So, so we did decide then to call it a non-fiction course, but we are not eschewing uh, fiction at all in the sense that I think it's one is that I think that, and I'm echoing really what the others have said, but for us, it was a very, very sharp perception that, uh, you know, it's sort of high time that a certain dignity was given to nonfiction. The ability to have nuance, to have depth, to have sensitivity, to unfold things in ways that recognize that you are not relying on the truth value, on the indexical, uh, to allow uh, nonfiction to avail of all those advantages, let's say, that fiction has had, uh, was one of the sort of aims. And, uh, you know, I mean, there really is a lot to say, but I, I can only say that, you know, as we went on and as the the sort of curriculum has developed, it seems to me that almost everything we do in some way or the other is about this. It's about unlearning the default positions around documentary, and it's about giving it certain privileges. You know. um, I mean, speaking of the indexical that Shohini just referred to, I of course agree, right up front, you know, you sort of underline it, this is the thing, but I have found at least that it doesn't work. I mean, it's it's something that you hear and it's something that you agree with at that time, but it's so ingrained in us, the idea that documentary is finally about truth and objectivity and fiction is about subjectivity and nuance and complexity, that it doesn't, I find that it doesn't work to say it, you know, in like four lectures or something. And so, in a sense, I would say that our entire curriculum is, in a sense, based on understanding this in some way or the other, in understanding that actually there is no such thing philosophically as objective versus subjective, one. And second, that when you reach out and look at reality with a capital R, you are in the very act of looking, interpreting. And so it's best to be aware of that. You know? So, uh, I mean, just for instance, one of, the, one of the projects, one of the modules we have, uh, in a way, it's the first time the students really put themselves out, is called the interview project, in which we actually take the stroke and we uh, completely, with examples, we deconstruct it. To see, uh, again, to echo something of what I think uh, Nilita was saying, is that why are you asking the question? Who are you asking the question to? Uh, you know, and actually some of these uh, observations or things that we do as teachers are so basic. Because when you look at the beginning of oral history, they're all there. And yet somehow in a documentary course, we don't give it enough significance. So then we felt it's time to, you know, sort of really, you know, do you need to even ask the question in the first place? Are the silences more eloquent than the speech? You know, how are, how is the person being interviewed responding to you? And how are you responding to them? And so on and so on. So, I mean, it also becomes a lot, you know, there's certain terms that are associated with, say, a trope like the interview, which is the idea of, strategizing to make somebody comfortable, for instance. So it's, it's a given. You just sort of have to learn it, you know. And so we completely turn the tables on that through practice, which is that to say that the strategy is not about making that person comfortable. It's about making yourself comfortable. So completely take the onus onto yourself. Uh, be willing to give up the power of the person holding the camera, of the documentary filmmaker, and to subvert it, but in practice. So that's the other thing that we, at least we have been doing, which is to completely meld theory and practice. Uh, because we are finding that that, you know, it, it sort of pushes the student into a position where they, they do have their eureka moments then, 
you know, and they're able to join the dots and find new languages. You know. So, um, you know, there is really so much to talk about, but I'll just take off from what Surabhi said about research, which I think, you know, it's very interesting the way you put it. And I would probably say a similar thing, but from a different perception, which is, uh, which has been very educative for me, actually, also, um, to see what research can do. Because, again, in documentary, you have, of course, the idea of research is very foregrounded in documentary, much more than in fiction. Uh, of course, both are fallacies. But uh, in documentary, very often, we are looking at research. And we are looking at ways to put it in the film. And in the most conventional way, one would say, one, it leads you to locations, perhaps where to film, who to film. Second, it could form part of your voiceover. Third, it could sort of lead you into who to talk to, who to interview, who can also mouth some of that information. So, you know, voiceover, text, and, you know, broadly, but these are all textual components. They're textual components, speech, you know, so somebody's speaking, or there's a voiceover, or there's a text, and so on. Interestingly, what one finds is that the, depending on how, uh, how intensively and how much, with how much sincerity the research is being done and mentored, it actually starts to form the image and the structure. And what I mean by that is that the student, when they get into the research process, they are actually starting a journey where they have no idea it's going to end. You know? uh, it's, it's actually quite magical what happens. And just to give you a brief example, uh, the, uh, you have a student looking at same-sex love. It's coming from a personal space. It's looking to see where to go. Uh, there's diary writing, there's interviews, there's interviews with experts, there's reading. The mentors give more and more stuff to read. Ends up reading a book, which was still in the process. It hadn't been printed yet. Accesses the author, goes and visits the author, finds out in the process a certain kind of poetry. Now, nobody had dreamed that poetry was going to come, but poetry came, and it was Rehti poetry. And he found it so inspiring that he ended up structuring the whole film around that. So the, the research, I mean, to put it sort of very uh, flatly, the research became the image, and the research became the structure. So the transmutation of research into form is something is absolutely lovely to see. And it has very, very lovely uh, sort of results. And I'll just say one more, and then I'll um, uh, you know, uh, let others speak, because otherwise this can go on. Um, we have a module in which we take the students away to another location for a month. Usually, it's been the hills. Uh, and uh, on one occasion, we were there for 30 days, and actually we did an entire research project there, in which actually no shooting, not even stills, were allowed till the last three days. And uh, very interesting things happened. Uh, through intensive mentoring, over 25 days, we had, for instance, a bunch of students who were researching on a vegetable vendor. And through going into layers and layers and layers of study and reading and talking to people, it actually turned into a research about migration. You know? And I think that these kind of understandings become very, very useful for students. For their work now, for their work in future, fiction work, documentary work, whatever they do. You know? So yes, yeah, I think that I think these aspects of the subjective, objective, of unlearning and of research uh, have to really underpin uh, work of this nature. 
Yes, I, I really see. I really see a kind of uh, resonance in what uh, different uh, panelists are saying. Probably, uh, you know, we are all looking at the same kinds of processes, and we have different ways, different languages in which uh, you know we are articulating it. Because also we are working with very different kinds of groups of uh, you know uh, students. Uh, Nilita, uh, you, you're teaching in a very different uh, context. Would you like to reflect both on the kind of pedagogy you use in the context of the kinds of questions that we've been discussing? Yeah, so uh, I teach at the Tisch School of the Arts in New York. And, uh, and I remember I was trying to get a foot into <laughs> this esteemed institution about 15 years ago. When my kids were very young, and I, you know, I wanted to teach here if possible, and I went and I had a meeting with the then chair of the undergraduate film and television department. And when I told him I'm a documentary filmmaker and I'd love to teach a documentary class here, he said to me, "Nobody is interested in the documentary. All the students who come here want to be writer directors. So I'm really sorry, but there's just no place for you here. We already have doc faculty and." There's just our enrollment is really poor uh, in, in the documentary. And then he said, well, um, if you can come up with a course that is just going to change the way documentary works, and if you can get students interested, then we might consider it. So come up with a course and you know pitch it to the curriculum committee. So, uh, so this was literally 15 years ago, and now I've been teaching this course at uh, at NYU Tisch for the last. This was this would be my 14th year this year. So my course that I came up with is called Documentary Fictions, and um, I, I certainly, you know, nobody was teaching anything like this then. So it, when it came up in front of the curriculum co committee, some people were like, "What the hell is that?" I mean. You know that's an oxymoron um, but the way what my cl uh, class does so it comes under history and criticism but it looks at the blurred boundaries between documentary and fiction that have in my view have existed uh, from the very beginning of the first camera that was built the daguerreotype in 1839 and it sort of traces those blurred boundaries all the way up to the present um, and I do this, you know, it's also looking at it philosophically, image making in the philosophical sense, also looking at what reality has meant uh, in the last 130 years of uh, cinema history. What has reality meant to different practitioners who have tried to represent it um, and how inevitably there have been fictions involved, uh, whether they are because of the filmmaker, who is thinking about the representation or is it because of the technology that was available at any given time that obviously you know, brought about changes in the way reality was viewed because of what was possible through technology and also cultural differences, how different cinemas around the world have looked at reality at different times. So it's this very eclectic kind of uh, very exciting, if I may say so myself, world cinema documentary class. And uh, it's, you know, it's always runs full. And I, I love it because um, the motto of my class is, you know, it, it started, starts with Marguerite's uh, beautifully rendered pipe and which is called Senepa Yun Peep, you know, this is not a pipe. So we are really looking at addressing that question. This is not a pipe through all, you know, through documentaries and fiction films made through the ages. And for me, I, you know what, so my ask my students, I mean, they've changed tremendously over the last 14 years, I would say, because, well, they live in a different world now. Now we are in the TikTok generation, right? So I literally have students in my class now who have made films in high school, who are, you know, who've, uh, who've really, I mean, sometimes you wonder, like, certainly I don't need to teach them craft as such because they've, they've, you know, there's a there's a teenager who arrived at Tisht last year, no, two years ago, who at 19 
had a film at Tribeca and, and was already awarded at Tribeca even before he entered Tish. So we are talking about this new generation that is very, very adept at uh, creating work, but they know nothing about, you know, film history. And, um, and I think I look back in my first class, which was 2008, and there also I felt, I mean, it's not that those students then knew cinema history, but, you know, you would expect them to have heard of Antonioni or Fellini or, you know, I mean, at least some of the big names or Godard or Truffaut, right? Uh, they would have heard of them. But um, now, honestly, I have to say there are students who have not even heard of these luminaries. And I feel, how can you, how can a student become a filmmaker, whether it's documentary or fiction, right? If you don't know what people have done, and it's when we have a very short history, we're talking about 130 years, right? It's not like literature or theater. So, so my challenge is at Tish is really to broaden their minds, to spark uh, new ways of looking at what the documentary can do, but also if they are fictional filmmakers, how they can learn from the documentary method it's a whole method, you know, of being and engaging with the world. So what can you learn from the documentary method that you can apply to your fictional filmmaking? So um, it's, it's very exciting, I have to say, because uh, even though in this class, I'm not actually here at Tish making them do documentary work or fiction work, you know, they'll be taking my class and they'll be enrolled in an advanced narrative class. So they'll be an, enrolled in an advanced doc class. But the ideas that get ignited in my class, I can just see how it sparks them in whatever they do, whether they're writing a script or they're, you know, working on some, you know, narrative fiction. And then they, it's their whole way of working becomes different. So I just find that really exciting, you know, and uh, uh, and also for me in this class, I also keep, you know, uh, I keep it alive because I'm always introducing new ideas and new work because now we are entering um, a, a space where documentary is very much in demand. Uh, the, our documentary classes run full, but they're very interesting hybrid works being made, you know, which really blur boundaries. And these are the uh, works you see on, even on television, I mean, uh, recently, uh, uh, one of the, what is considered to be one of the most interesting uh, documentary series that's on television right now is something like How To with John Wilson. I mean, I just watched one of those episodes and it's just, you just cannot, you don't know, you don't have the words to describe it because it is a documentary filmmaker who goes out into the world, but he's creating art, he's writing poetry, he's doing animation, he's doing a performative art piece, and it's all part of this, you know, uh, really wondrous way of looking at reality. So it's just a very, very, ex I think it's a very, very exciting time to, uh, with the new equipment um, and the new possibilities and the new kinds of funding to to venture into this field, you know, and not look at everything in these watertight compartments, you know, because still we have festivals that are documentary festivals and fiction film festivals. And we have, you know, documentary films are called documentaries, which I consider a misnomer, but fiction films are called narratives. I mean, every documentary is a narrative. So what are these watertight compartments? And they really need to be shot down, you know, I think even within documentary programs. Yeah, thank you, Nilita. Yeah, I, I think what many of us have been saying on this panel is the is how boundaries are really ha perhaps have always been blurred despite our trying to put them into dichotomies and boxes and and uh, you know uh, part of unlearning as we've been talking about the process is also about rethinking these uh, you know boundaries whether and uh, whether it is you know uh, art versus uh, you know activism or uh, you know fiction versus uh, you know uh, documentary uh, shoini would you like to uh, you know come in on this and you know the ways in which uh, your program addresses because your students do all kinds of work, uh, you know, they, they yeah. make 
fiction, they make documentary. And yeah, a lot of the stuff that, uh, you know, uh, Nilita was talking about had very strong resonances. Well, I have to say about the Mass Communication Center in Jamia Millia Islamia, it was, it was started by three people who were very committed to the documentary. And, uh, you know, James Beveridge, who was already a very eminent filmmaker, his wife, Margaret Beveridge, both very close to John Grierson. Anwar Jamal Kidwai, this uh, extraordinary visionary who came up with this media school, uh, wanted, you know, to foreground the documentary because he had a very poor opinion of fiction films. He felt very bad that people from FTII only went into the film industry. So I would say it was my generation that gave some respect back to the narrative film or the fiction film, particularly the popular film, you know, which has deeply influenced me, you know, the Hindi popular film, uh, but which wasn't at all respectable to say when I was young. So we would lie and say that we liked Satyajit Ray, which we also did. But, uh, you know, nobody would take us seriously if we said that we liked uh, uh, Hindi cinema. So if somebody says, who did you, you know, I, and I said this to Shabana herself, that people would say, who do you like? Who is your favorite actress? I would say Shabana uh, Azmi, when actually it was Zina Taman or somebody else. So I'm very happy that we are at a point when, you know, we don't have to be apologetic about any of this and we can draw influences from all of that. So right now, one of the things that, you know, Nilita said is very correct that, uh, you know, that you are taking a class and there are also other people in Sejamia who are taking documentary films. Most of us kind of generally have a very broad agreement, which happens when you are working together. But then there are all kinds of different influences. So I can never say that my class will actually change them forever or that the industry won't change them. You just try to make that, you know, you try to open a few doors and hope that some of those insights, you know, will remain uh, with them. But I uh, now more and more, I'm trying to push the students to actually break these boundaries and move towards hybrid filmmaking. And I must say that some of the more interesting films that have been made by the students in the recent past have been hybrid films. Uh, you know, many of them have gone to festivals. But again, I don't want to only emphasize the festival because that has become that seems to have become the most important place to go to. And I think that some of the other stuff of showing it around, even if it's a small group of people, uh, you know, to you know, places that may not be a festival, I think all those practices are important, but are not very popular at the moment, actually. Uh, the festival circuit has become very, very popular. But, uh, you know, films that I, as a teacher, or just as an audience, I mean, most of all, I see myself as just a lover of films. I just love to see films, whether, even whether it's student films made by somebody else. And some of the films that really fill me with joy are these very interesting hybrid films. I also feel that there's a whole range of nonfiction work that is very interesting, including say the BDS films that are made by people like John Grayson. We show a lot of that in class, the mashups, the music videos. So all of that actually, uh, you know, allows you to enter a very, interesting kind of world. Uh, the other, uh, you know, uh, project that is becoming interesting, uh, both for scholars and for practitioners is the whole question of the archive. There's so much interesting work going on in the archive Then you have Jamie Barron's, you know, festival inappropriation, you know, how do you use found footage? How do you use the archive? So this whole question of and now we have a PhD program which has a practice-based PhD. So that a lot of people who are practitioners of the documentary are also scholars of the documentary you know, doing very, very interesting work on new kinds of documentary film. So I think that we are at a very interesting point where a lot of the information uh, that we are conveying to the students, as you know, Nilita very correctly said, that they know the craft, they do a lot of stuff. By the time they come to Jamia, they've already made some film on their smartphone. But what they do lack is this theoretical understanding of what has happened. So it's important to not only just talk about the new trends, but to say a lot of the new trends have a long uh, history and a legacy. As you know, Nilita absolutely correctly pointed out that, that the blurring of boundaries hasn't happened now. It has always been there. Robert Flaherty's films have always done that. So there's a whole range of you know, work that we can show them. Uh, that you know that can have resonances and just hope that in this world where you're assaulted with so much uh, that some of what they learn in school will remain with them but uh, we can only hope for that 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, the I think what everyone is saying is pointing to the kind of uh, you know diversity of uh, ways of seeing that are emerging within documentary practice itself, within uh, you know the way we uh, work with our students to unlearn and and learn. Uh, you know, collaboratively. Uh, and uh, I guess all of us are working with very different kinds of students at different levels, uh, you know, different programs of very different durations. Uh, but maybe I, I thought we could, uh, you know, uh, look at our students themselves and, uh, you know, where do they come from? What is do, What is the kind of diversity that uh, because uh, there's one thing that I, I feel is that our student uh, population in some ways has become far more diverse, though now the trend is towards, uh, you know, making, uh, you know, higher education, uh, you know, more and more inaccessible. But at least thus far, there has been a tremendous diversity uh, in, uh, you know, the student population, which, of course, also... Uh, you know, can be a challenge. So I don't know. Jayashankar, would you like to reflect on this? <clears throat> no, we are like uh, like Jamia, a uh, public funded university. So our emphasis is on bringing uh, uh, in those students otherwise would have no access to university education. And, you know, that's done through various uh, uh, programs. And I don't want to go into those details. Uh, so we have a very diverse group of students in terms of the social background. For instance, we have uh, quite a bit of uh, first generation learners uh, and uh, uh, and they come from small towns and, you know, villages across the, across the country. So that brings in a lot of diversity. And we are also uh, fairly, I mean, for the MA program, uh, discipline agnostic. So we have, uh, we, the students have very, very different disciplinary orientation. In fact, 70% of our applicants, not only for our program, all the programs at this are engineers. So, so we have this classroom, which is, you know, uh, uh, so our creator, for example, is thinking doers and doing thinkers. So, you know, obviously there is this diversity itself points to that possibility. And uh, we, we see the diversity itself as a great strength, though it's sometimes very challenging. Where do you pitch? For example, the practice-based courses, as uh, Nilita pointed out, they have access to technology and they have done them, but whatever the theory. So there is a lot of patchiness when you speak to somebody who has done liberal arts as opposed to somebody who has done engineering. There are challenges there. But we, uh, real we realize that, you know, we, uh, we because of the group work, they bring in their own competencies into it and they learn from each other. So the engineers learn from, you know, the liberal arts students or the, the other way around. So it's it's an interesting uh, uh, possibility there. Uh, but of course, not all of them are interested in documents. Uh, and because they are not exposed to it as an idea or they're, I mean, they might have done films, but the whole theoretical horizon or the history of these genres or with this connection with, uh, you know, the idea of fiction as opposed to non-fiction. These are some of the ideas that we need to kind of, you know, uh, complicate in our classroom. Uh, but of course, many of them develop strong interest in uh, uh, an inclination for documentary work. And uh, not that, I mean, not if professionally, some of them are able to, you know, pursue it as a, as a career. But what also we find interesting is that, you know, the whole journalistic practice so many of them go into journalism and the new kind of journalism which brings together, you know, the idea of a hybridity where, you know, the whole earlier specialization between, you know, there's an editor, there's a cinematographer, there is a director. But they, because of the kind of exposure to this, uh, the kind of work that they do, they can bring a new perspective into doing journalism in the sense that they do shoot their, uh, their stories and you know, they also write and they can do a bit of graphics too. So, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting possibility that emerges and we find that many of them going into, you know, new portals as well, but uh, contributing and uh, uh, significantly to those uh, narratives as well. Uh, would anybody like to come in on this to talk about the kinds of students they have uh, worked with? Something. Yeah, yes, yeah, sure. 
Surabhi, I think, had raised a hand to say something. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, uh, It was actually not to this. It was to the to the earlier point. So, uh, so I'm wondering whether to let it go or, or move on to students. I think all uh, of what we are saying is uh, kind okay. of... Okay. I'll just, I'll just bring in uh, something that sort of, uh, you know, listening to Samira, Nidita and Shohini that uh, you know, one of the things, uh, the, one of the things that I find myself working, well, not working against, but trying very hard to get students to critique, uh, and it's something that began, something that 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 trend had already begun um, when you know when I was I was I was more a practicing filmmaker and seeing the kind of trends around me uh, was the tyranny of this. Uh, Three act structure narrative in documentary and centered around a character. You know, um, I, I just you know at at a time when I felt that uh, the reason why documentary allowed me to the the form allowed me to breathe when I came out of film film school that was centered around fiction was just the 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 breathless uh, freedom of just going anywhere where the structure the argument can define your 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 structure where where a sensorial immersement can define the structure and i felt that we were sort of really uh, really exploding in that uh, sense uh, until the time where suddenly there was there was money and interest in in documentary and then i had my own critique of how uh, a character-driven three-act kind of narrative structure with conflict and so on and so forth is suddenly gaining some kind of currency in in the, the, even the festival uh, net uh, circuit, but of course with with television. After coming here, I find that that stranglehold is even more intense. You know, um, I think given that in India there are just so many of us, and only very few have access to that money, everyone is still having a, a, a field day actually. But in many other, so I have students from you know all kinds of places. I find that there is that sense of wanting to tell that narrative of that character that will get visibility in the Western festival or the Western television circuit and now with Netflix all the more so and nothing that fiction can do can terrorize or, or diminish our form as much as 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 this not to say that I have a problem with characters uh, or character driven films is just that uh, especially given many of our you know uh, you know south south kind of locations the only films that are supposedly legible, are ones which are centered around the three act structure and the character driven film and that you know and that that brings me well not to the question of students but to the idea of the audience that has developed and the idea of of the economy of documentary filmmaking you know and i think it's all got muddied together uh, in in ways that is really diminishing uh, the field and i think I think, and I personally know of the work that you know, uh, you know, Samira or or you at TIS or Jamia uh, or Nilita are doing, uh, you know, with students to to open it up. But I think it's a challenge we really need to think about. So I I'm always reeling against it, of course, uh, uh, in class, in in as least nagging way possible. Sort of, there's enough work and more, as Nilita said. There's so much to really throw students into different directions. And I keep telling them, I was like, you you, you worry about selling your films after you have left uh, uh, you know, a university setting. Uh, here you worry about who are you and what do you want to say and how do you want to say it? You know, but really I think uh, uh, that kind of a wall that is developed in front of us quite rapidly actually is, uh, is something that I'm still trying to, uh, you know, work out. Um, I don't think it was there. When I entered the field of wanting to be a documentary filmmaker, uh, it was not the only only form within documentary. And I don't know when it became the marketable form, you know. 
um, the most boring three act structure which even fiction has has abandoned has really come into the the fore uh, you know where is your story going is a question that i have forbidden in my classroom i just wanted to put it up yeah yeah the you you point to uh, uh, you know very important and uh, very sort of disturbing uh, you know uh, direction in which uh, at least documentary in india has uh, moved and maybe elsewhere too uh, you know there, there's a kind of flattening out of the language uh, 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 and a kind of uh, you know obsession with uh, you know getting into festivals and i think all that in a sense uh, a very competitive sort of uh, you know space that's emerging that i think also uh, adds to it uh, and i think these are some of the challenges that we do face as documentary teachers i think we are uh, sort of we were asked to give 25 minutes for discussion so we have just 15 minutes left maybe we could uh, you know move on to uh, talking about some of the challenges we because i think in a way so ruby uh, introduced that idea the the kinds of challenges that we face as teachers given the kinds of students we work with given the kinds of the the larger context of uh, you know uh, documentary film itself uh, in the indian context uh, you know how what are these challenges and how do we creatively uh, work if, with them if uh, anjali if before we move to the next uh, topic if i may just add to this and yeah sure it's just a question i had about diversity uh, or the kinds of students who come in and this is following up from very important work that's happened say in the world of journalism or in the world of edu you know education for instance people tracking the iims have found that there are very few dalit students or people looking at um, uh, you know places where journalism happens at newspaper offices are tracking how many you know dalits or students from minority groups are actually there in the workplace here this is just a general question perhaps it applies more to it's a question more to you know shohini to anjali to you and jay shankar and sabira mo perhaps less so to surabhi and nilita though questions of diversity can also come up in your institutions we may not necessarily be talking about dalit students or Uh, st students from minority background. Just, do we have any numbers or any sense of whether numbers of students are growing, Dalit students or uh, you know minority students, or is it more or less the same? If you could just speak to that. Should I begin? Yeah. Yes, Shoni. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the wonderful things about being in a place like Jamia or Delhi University or JNU is that. you get a huge diversity of students you know people who, as anjali had said first generation learners you know and that that is really wonderful because our fees are still not high but i was just going to say that it's really threatened by the new education policy because the new education policy is going to actually is moving gradually all these you know government organized uh, central universities towards a kind of a privatized mode so i don't know how long we will be able to have this kind of a diversity even you know uh, class diversity for instance as far as caste diversity is concerned jamia became a minority institution uh, about 10 years or more than 10 years back and so now the reservation is for muslims uh, uh, 50% uh, what that has affected are actually other caste based reservations uh we have uh, uh, you know much uh, less sc candidates much less st candidates now uh, and but on the other hand we have muslim candidates from across the country and that's really wonderful we have first generation learners from kerala you know father is probably a tempo driver or you know so we have a, a diversity there but sadly the caste and uh, the scheduled tribe scheduled caste category uh, in that we have you know very few numbers but the this uh, this class based diversity that we have uh, that i think is something of great value which i really feel is going to be now threatened by the new education policy 
because education, especially in a place like MCRC, might over the next four or five years become very, very prohibitive for a certain class of people. Uh, yes, this is a context that I think, uh, you know, very, very difficult uh, challenge that, uh, and I think so in that sense, you know, uh, uh, I mean, Lalit's sort of question segues into the whole idea of challenges. I don't know, Jai Shankar, would you like to, of course, we have very recently left, uh, you know, uh, full-time teaching within a public funded institution, but we are quite aware of the kinds of problems that uh, the NEP has introduced really and and the, and the fears of a lot of uh, teachers across the country. So, uh, I mean, as Shoini said, we still, we have at the moment about 49 percentage of, you know, uh, of a method, I mean, the students from uh, SEST, OBC and other backgrounds. So, you know, it's, it's there at the moment, but I, we don't know what is going to happen in the years to come. Uh, so as far as uh, challenges in teaching documentary or you know uh, is uh, is concerned the possibilities of distribution and dissemination continues to be a big issue and that kind of uh, affects students continued engagement with documentary particularly after they graduate i mean they are interested in this because it's not sustainable perhaps to embark on a career which is uh, you know you can make documentaries that's a major challenge that you have the other uh, question is that the, the current political climate, I don't need to expatiate on it, it's not conducive to product, production of any material that is remotely political. And obviously documentaries tend to be political in many ways than one. Uh, and there's always hurt sentiments. Uh, and uh, this has posed uh, problems uh, for working with uh, the genre within an institutional uh, uh, setting, you know. As they make a film, and you know, it gets into all kinds of other uh, uh, issues, and then you know, then we need to deal with it at the institution. Uh, the and it had a very practical kind of issue that we face today is that you know, uh, access to public space uh, for shooting itself is being restricted. You know, you the students kind of start shooting, and a policeman will land up and invariably stop them from shooting. So, if in the earlier days, the I mean, it's it, in some way the frontier of censorship has now expanded to include even the process of shooting itself. Because earlier it would be, you know, uh, stopping, uh, I mean, material resources to somebody like Anand Patwar than where he couldn't shoot at all to start with, to kind of distribution at later stage, various kinds of uh, regimes of control. Today it's kind of even, you know, you can't even shoot. You know? So that's another issue that I, I would uh, kind of flag. And of course, what we've been trying to do, I mean, it's just an experiment, is to kind of use uh, the student documentary as a spine to create web archives, uh, which kind of uh, pulls in not only the, the films, but also crowdsource other films related to this particular theme that they're working, which is, uh, 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 and then also bring in uh, written material. So, you know, kind of embed this documentary narrative itself in a larger kind of context and uh, help the audience uh, read this documentary in the context of various other discourses around it. Uh, Samira, would you like to uh, come in? Uh, yeah, sure. I think we are in a particular kind of situation here. And uh, really, in a sense, I'm quite envious of, uh, you know, the situations that Shohini and you are talking about. But on the other hand, See, we are in a private institution, but it's a private institution that does not uh, make profits. So it's a not-for-profit private institution. And coupled with this anomaly is the fact that our course is a very intensive course that puts a lot of weight on individual mentoring. So we don't want the numbers to become too large. So this has been quite a difficult, I mean, extremely difficult thing to deal with because naturally we don't want the fees to go up too much. On the other hand, quite rightly, the management finds it difficult because you are working with less students, more faculty, 
you know, and the numbers don't work out. So basically, it's been quite a struggle. Uh, so far, we have, um, I think we have managed also because we had a grant for a while from uh, Gete, a uh, small grant which helped us. But, uh, you know, in terms of opening it out, we have in our own ways, because some of us personally who are there obviously have the same preoccupations of wanting it to be open and more democratic and open to all sorts of groups of people. So we have in our own ways tried, but we are now in the process of uh, trying to generate some scholarships, which would help us in this direction. And it, I, I must say, ours is really quite a unique situation, because even though we are limited by the lack of numbers and so on, it's also that it's given us a very strange kind of freedom, you know. So we are actually working interdisciplinary almost, you know. Like we have a, we have, I put together a reader, CBC reader, which has got readings from Komal Kothari, Rustam Bharucha, Anton Chekhov, you know, uh, George Orwell, you know, because they're all looking at the idea of representation and the interpretation, you know which is all feeding in in some way. And we, we read these texts, we discuss them, we call in practice, practitioners from other fields. We've had Maya Rao, the dancer, coming in, talking about gesture and narrative. Narrative is something we are very interested in, you know? so, which is also why looking at ethnomusicology, Rustam Bharucha, uh, Komal Kothari's work. Uh, we've also had installation artists coming in. Uh, we've had people like uh, Kavita Singh from JNU coming in, speaking about narrative in miniature. So it's very fragile what we are working with, I think, because we don't have a proper, uh, you know, like a large, the benefit of a large institutional uh, structure. And I know that those have the flip side also. They have the negatives as well. I'm very aware of that. But also we are not flush with funds. You know? So. We are just, I have a feeling that this needs to move in some direction and one can't exactly foresee it. But it's a bit like, you know, along with directing the course, one is sort of gently directing it into some, some direction, which hopefully will be able to contain the diversity that we also require. Um. Surubi and uh, Surubi, would you like to uh, come in on this? Uh, uh, the challenges you face may be of a different order of what, uh, you know, Shoini or, uh, uh, you know, in, in, uh, people in public funded institutions, people in, you know, private not for profit institutions. So you're, you're teaching in a very different context. Would you like to? Uh, talk about what you feel are the challenges and you know the ways in which you try sure. to no so there, there there are two two parts of my experience one is uh, being in 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 bombay until 3 years ago one was engaging with a lot of uh, institutions whether it was nid or it is ftii or it is the 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 kr narayan film school in kerala or samira's uh, space uh, you know, so um, so there there was a way in which you could see uh, the uh, the idea of diversity within a, a public institution, which is uh, which would op or if, even Whistling Woods. I have also worked a lot with Whistling Woods uh, versus, let's say, a Whistling Woods, which is private uh, and a particular kind of fee structure, or a CDC, which is which is private but definitely not Whistling Woods. You know, so one had a sense of what that diversity can or cannot do and what it enables and what it doesn't but here in uh, in nyu ad it's been quite uh, uh, i mean there is there is diversity in terms of ethnicity and nationalities for sure of a kind that is is uh, is incredible but what i've found is especially a lot of our students come from south asia and my assumption before I came was that this would be a particular kind of South Asian students, one who have gone to IB schools and so on and so forth. But I find the reverse. 
uh, of course, there is a whole category of people who know of this place because they went to this IB school or the other. But uh, somehow it has circulated that NYU AD, unlike NYU or NYU Shanghai, uh, the UAE government subsidizes almost most 80 to 90 percent of the tuition. So it has enabled a, a cross section of students from across the world, East Europe, Africa, the Arab countries, Latin America, um, China, Korea, of course, South Asia, of course, but a cross section of, of people. And of course, one can say for sure that amongst the South Asian students, you, you do not see caste diversity. Even those who might have come from, from um, economic settings that are far more modest, uh, there is a certain kind of social mobility and social currency that caste gives you that, uh, that, that holds you back from a space like this. But in terms of minorities, uh, being UAE and being a, a, a particular kind of relationship that minorities in India, whether it's Christian or uh, Muslim populations have with this region historically, uh, you know, so it's a, to discuss South Asia here is, is, is particularly uh, like a, a, a very uh, energizing experience because you, you, you suddenly have a student from Nepal who is completely throwing the, the student from Hyderabad off skilter about South Asia or, or somebody from Pakistan who has grown up in Zanzibar, who is, you know, so it's a, it's allowed for a, a, a cross section of views that are, I would not still claim to be truly diverse, but enough to, to sort of really make you go out. And that's what an educational institution needs to do, right? Make you really go out of your comfort zone to reflect on everything you think you know. And, and that possibility exists. But, um, but the kind of diversity question that we face in India in the education, uh, you know, that just gets completely, uh, completely erased in a space like this. But I think, I think it's an important tension to have in any educational institution. Uh, what what Whistling the Woods in Bombay does really, uh, and what uh, an FTI or an NID or a TIS is able to do, um, is 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 very uh, uh, important for our conversations around the future of education. Uh, and I'm I'm not saying one is better than the other. I'm just saying a place like CDC is just has to open up a way to think through higher education differently from the public institution model as well, given the, the place we have come to. Uh, I, I, I don't know if that makes sense, but just some thoughts I'm throwing out. Uh, Nilta, somebody who is, uh, you know, looking at all this from a very different space. And of course, but at the same time, I mean, you are quite engaged with what is happening uh, uh, in the Indian context within education, would you like to reflect on this? Or maybe even from your own? No, I mean, I do teach in Chennai, so I do have some uh, Dalit students every year in my class. And um, what it's made me do is I realize that I am rethinking constantly how I teach. Um, because it's I find the whole system is really unfair and stacked against students from SCST backgrounds. I mean, at the Asian College of Journalism, it's fantastic that some of these students are on scholarships. They also have scholarships for SARC countries. So there are always a few students in my class who, who are from a very unprivileged background. And, some, and I realize they have a real difficulty with English. Uh, something as simple as that, you know, that I'm teaching in English, the films I show, uh, for the most part, uh, even if they are foreign films, they are subtitled in English. And, uh, I've, and unfortunately, I have to grade. grade. I wish I, I could teach a class without having to grade students because I'm, what I really am trying to do is to get them to think critically, to trust their own responses, and to go out into the world and make interact with some with a reality and shoot something you know in a very authentic way that is meaningful to them 
I really wish I didn't have to grade, but I do have to grade. So now I'm really, I've only been teaching there for a few years now, but I'm always thinking pedagogically because I am after all teaching with the documentary, which is a visual medium. Now how to teach that without, you know, it being English centric. So of course I, we, you know, I deconstruct all the films we look at. So I allow the film itself, like, you know, a scene to speak visually. And, and to connect visually. And my job is really to point that out because I'm dealing with all kinds of students. I have a student, you know, from Ashoka University who's come with a very different background. And then I've got a student right now who, who literally has borrowed money to take this class, you know. And, and I don't have um, the time. I don't have like six months with them where I could get to know each student individually and work at an individual level. I have to, I just have a month so uh, these these are real challenges but i'm really you know i'm really rethinking all the time how i teach in a way that i'm reaching out to each student by trying to you know take take them aside speak to them maybe not have them write a paper because i realize you know they're supposed to write a weekly response and uh, just to see i just want to see how their thinking is developing you know, from week to week, depending on what we've seen. And I realize immediately there's a student who really cannot express themselves at all. So how am I going to judge that weekly response? So now I'm, what I'm trying to do is, you know, take the student aside and say, okay, choose a film we've seen, take a scene, and I want you to talk to me and I want to sh you to show me what's happening in that scene. And so if this is your idea, how are you going to approach it, right? So, uh, so it is very challenging, but it's, uh, it's, I'm really, you know, constantly thinking about this. And to me, what was really um, wonderful, like was a few years ago, there was a student in my class who was literally failing in all her weekly responses. And, and I heard that she was failing all her other classes. But at the end, when, you know, they each make a little film and they do this research project, she did something really incredibly wonderful. Uh, because she had an eye, she had an approach, she was really invested visually in a way that she couldn't express through her written work, you know. So uh, that film got into the festival, you know, um, uh, because I have this thing now, uh, some of our best student works get shown at the Chennai Film Festival, which is wonderful for the students. And so it's, it was just for her, I mean, you know, it was a, such a sense of accomplishment, you know. Uh, for someone who was really failing because they just couldn't, they didn't have those critical thinking skills. They didn't know how to express them, let's say in English, you know, in any way. So, um, so I think it's a real challenge. And I think with this medium, at least, you know, I think we can be more flexible and figure out how to, how to teach. And I think that's what I'm really, um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to work on. I mean, it's not, that's not an issue here in New York, but I certainly find it something I have to deal with in Chennai. Uh, I think one of the challenges uh, which we haven't spoken about and I think uh, which all teachers are currently facing is the whole context of the pandemic uh, over the past uh, couple of years. And uh, of course, this has affected, uh, you know, our teaching, our ability to interact with students, our, ability to bring in all kinds of students with different, uh, you know, accesses to uh, equipment and uh, the internet, uh, you know, uh, all of this sort of complicates, uh, you know, our, our, our ability to teach, our ability, the ability of students to learn. So I wonder if uh, uh, any of you, all of you would like to reflect on this very new context that I think all of us are still grappling with. Shohini, would you? Yes. Um, well, uh, this has been ex extremely challenging to say the least, because all of a sudden we had to migrate online and uh, students were not prepared for that. So they didn't have, you know, proper signal, connectivity, all that. So we did a kind of a a survey just to see who has what. Now things have settled quite a bit. And I have to say that while there are a lot of downsides, because I'm very much an offline classroom teacher, and I don't like to look into these little boxes. 
but it has its advantages. I mean, the very fact that we are having this discussion with all of us, somebody in Abu Dhabi, somebody somewhere else, and in New York, that itself, and that has been actually quite useful for us because we've been able to get so many people to come and talk to our students who would, if we had to wait for them to come physically, may not even have happened. Uh, in, uh, you know, I teach classes on screenwriting, and that has helped me because I can actually stretch the class hours. So if I if I had, a say, a three-hour class uh, and I had a physical class, then everything that I had to do, I would have to do at that point. Whereas now I can just give them, say, three films to watch. And that doesn't become part of my class hours. So there are many pluses. Uh, but I had to fight a very big battle with the administration to allow students to come and work practically. Because uh, in Jamia, if you're not working on the equipment, then it really doesn't make any sense. Our students won't get hired anywhere. So that was uh, a very big battle. But we now have a situation where students come in staggered batches. Uh, so uh, the theoretical classes, which have about 45 people, 55 people, or more than that, sometimes, you know, our CBCS classes have more than that. Uh, that we do online. And the practical exercises, instead of everybody being there at the same time, in all the courses, because we have animation and mass communication and, uh, you know, uh, development communication, journalism. Uh, in all these uh, courses, when students have to work practically, uh, we break them into smaller batches. They come and they work and they go away. So that's how we have managed to do both. Uh, try to kind of, you know, use the online uh, uh, the, the online option in the best possible way and then try to get the students to come. The problem of the staggered batches, of course, is that it extends your semester in the sense that it takes more time. And the student, uh, the teachers also have to, you know, uh, kind of uh, do a lot of repeat teaching when people are coming to, you know, do their exercises. But it's certainly much better than, you know, sitting at home. But what it has done is that... Uh, even though one of the students managed to make a film during that time, which won awards, etc. But largely, it became very difficult for any kind of documentary filmmaking. Uh, so the last two years, that's been a very, very big problem. Uh, because fiction film, you can still kind of get a location and, you know, shoot there. But in the documentary, that that has been, you know, greatly affected. And I'm hoping that now things will kind of come back to normal. Many of the, you know, uh, Surabhi just said that, uh, you know, she has she's taking offline classes uh, today. JNU is opening up from tomorrow uh, in our course. Of course, students have been coming. Hopefully things will normalize a little more. But even when they normalize, I'm not willing to entirely give up on the online because when it has come to guest lectures and webinars, it has been an extremely useful space. Yeah, certainly. Uh, uh, am I, can I be heard? Yeah, so certainly, yes, the, the pandemic has thrown up opportunities. But there's also a downside, as you pointed out, particularly with practical programs and the amount of time and access that students might have to equipment. Samira, could you, uh, you know, talk about this, uh, you know, have you faced this challenge of students and how have you worked with it? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. We started the last batch uh, in 2020, in the middle of the pandemic. And uh, uh, of course, I, I'll not even repeat, I'll echo everything Shohini has said, the advantage of the online, the difficulties of not being offline, etc. But basically what has happened is that we have worked very, very hard. There's been a lot of innovation. Um, and uh, without going into all that, I mean, there's no time really. But uh, um, I would say that the, the whole cinematography thing was dealt with very, very imaginatively. Uh, so that students were able to shoot in their immediate uh, sort of locations. Uh, some of our teachers were online for up to 10 hours a day, off and on so that they could really do individual sessions with students. They found ways to hook up their cameras to their computers so that you know a certain kind of reading of the image could happen. Um, students have been shooting um, in all the phases where the 
the COVID numbers were high, obviously they were indoors. But every little chink of time we got, we have used. So every time things opened out, we were out and they were with full precautions. Nobody got COVID because of coming to college or shooting because we were so, so careful. Um, I took them out for a month uh, right after the second wave, came back, no COVID. They did a lot of shooting there. Um, the really bad time was actually the second wave because what happened then was that we were on the verge of breaking into, in a sense, the ideas for the diploma films. Um, for this batch, you know, we've had the students have come in with film ideas. And through the two years of the course, we developed those ideas. So uh, that was, you know, quite a downer. And it was terrible. Every family had COVID. People were dying. It was just a terrible, terrible time. And then actually we um, uh, basically put our heads together and formulated something, which ended up becoming very exciting, which is that um, starting to look at films which have a different kind of visual language. So instead of always being in this default mode of, oh, I can't shoot, so there's no film. Uh, what about looking at cinema? that has done very, very exciting work in either, either in situations of political censorship, where there is, uh, you know, constraints of another kind, or in situa other situations. So we actually put together a whole new module that we've never done before over some, over a month of viewings and discussion, all online looking at a range of films, right from, let's say, Farooqi's work to Aisha Abraham's work uh, to even some of Kiero Stami and um, quite a lot more. Um, so it was actually very exciting for me as well because I had never really, you know, academically worked on something like this and I, I made a lot of discoveries. So, uh, yeah, so I think we've, we've uh, managed but of course, uh, it's been very, very tough. We've all worked like four times as hard in the last two years. So, but yes, I agree, Shohini. Without Zoom, where would we be? I mean, without the online platforms, we'd be finished. Interesting. Uh, uh, would, would, uh... Nilita or uh, uh, Surbi want to come in on this? Uh, yeah, Surbi, yes. And uh, Nilita, if I may. Uh, I, 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 messages that were going back and forth, I couldn't read them. And okay. I think one said that Nilita is threatening to leave in 10 minutes or something like that. <laughs> right. Let's, in fact, if we can have final comments, then, and then I, actually our time is almost up. Almost up. Uh, I'll just quickly wrap up the the pandemic uh, the pandemic uh, uh, situation and you know I found it again of course the challenges and all of that we had students who were in different parts of the world many of them were stuck here on campus with their parents and families really sick so it was emotionally an extremely stressful time but you know one of the things that turned out to be very liberating for us especially for me as a teacher in this institution is this institution has got too many resources. The kind of equipment students uh, have access to is is uh, is somewhat unbelievable for my Indian Indian uh, independent documentary brain to even imagine. And the fact that students were stuck either in their rooms across the building from me or stuck in their room somewhere in Taiwan or wherever uh, really opened up the possibility of going back to what we started with the politics of the image. And that's it. They they had sometimes their fancy little cameras of their own or their cell phone and the Zoom camera. And they had a sense of constricted space and endless time. And I just took these elements. And for that first semester when we shut down, I just worked with the, the conceptual and the, the, the creative um, 
you know, capacity of these ideas to open up film language in a way that was exhilarating. I, I cannot even describe to you. Uh, and I told them, I said, feel free to dig into your phone archive. Feel free to steal anything from anywhere on the internet and, and start speaking. Start speaking not in, in words, but start speaking about the things that, uh, that matter and find find language in the composition, in the cut, in the duration of the shot, and so on and so forth. And I, I, think, uh, I think that was amongst the most exhilarating, uh, emotionally upsetting, but uh, intellectually, I think, stimulating. So that entire group of students actually made their final films all in the pandemic. And uh, I, I must say, I was quite proud of those films. So yeah, that was my my response to the pandemic question. Uh, Nilita, would you like to say something uh, before we wind up? I'll just uh, follow on Surabhi's footsteps. So in in our uh, in my doc fictions class, each student normally comes up with a doc fiction idea. Uh, they can see one. And of course, what happened when I was teaching remotely was all those ideas were based on Zoom, virtual reality, virtual communication, the creation of app, apps, the creation of a video game, all involving the documentary. So some really brilliant ideas were flaunted, uh, much though I really don't did miss not being there in person and not seeing people's expressions and, you know, just that gestural language, which is so important when you are teaching documentary and looking at documentaries, but some very, very interesting ideas were ignited being in that lockdown mode. Yeah, I think it's time for us to wind up. So Lalit, uh, handing over to you and thank you very much. This has been an absolutely fascinating discussion and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you all. Um, really a big, big thank you to uh, Jay Sankar, to Milita, Samira, Shoni, Surabhi, and, and to you, Anjali, for moderating the session. This has been just fascinating. Um, just final words, I'd just like to say that with this uh, panel, uh, festival finally comes to an end. So I just like to end by thanking a few people and institutions without whom the Crossing Swim Festival would not have been possible. First of all, a big thank you to the uh, DRRD, the German Academic Exchange Service, for their generous funding of the film series that enabled us to bring you these films and these discussions. Um, finally, a big thank you also to the team without whom the festival would not have been possible. Um, I'm just going to mention uh, our team members. So first of all, a big thank you to my colleague, uh, Karin Klenker, who had the idea for this festival in the first place uh, for her fundraising efforts and for coordinating the CMS uh, activities, to Valia Carvalho for the outreach and coordination by Namaste Plus. Um, my thanks also to Rohit Mishra and Felix Giesman for handling the website, the mailing and invitations, the StreamYard broadcasts and the technical side of things. Um, a very big thank you also to Apurva Olve for handling the communications with the filmmakers and the discussants. And finally, big thanks also to Gabriela Rabica and Birgit Prima for handling the financial administration side of things. And finally, a big, big thank you to our audience for watching and for participating. So at Crossings, we hope to be back Definitely not next year because it's a lot of work, but maybe we will have another online or hybrid festival a couple of years down the road. Um, we've had a lot of fun with this film series and we look forward to that second edition sometime in the near future. Until then, uh, it's goodbye from all of us at Crossings. Have a safe, uh, healthy, happy and successful 2022. Bye everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you bye bye. Thank you. It's a great series. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Thanks for being there and participating. Thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.